Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back, Julie. It is March the 10th, and we have a really fun show. Actually, you prepared this while I was on Clubhouse this morning, and I love this topic. I love your points. Uh, and I see that you use Jordan Peterson um, in his new book as your inspiration for today's podcast. I'm sure they're going to love it. Yes, some very interesting points and, um, you know, thoughtful things. That I think that the whole time management thing and having an ideal schedule and making well, myself do what I don't want to do. So the title of the today's podcast. And the tyranny of the schedule. Right. And I think a lot of our listeners, and you know, this is kind of a hot topic, kind of not really a sexy topic like time management. Oh, right. let's get excited about that, Right. But it's something that they have like constant consternation about. I think on the on the sort of top producing end of the spectrum, you heard some of this on Clubhouse this morning, for example. You know, they'll even the most successful person think like they have this thing that they think they should beat themselves up over their schedule. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't strap on the headset for two hours this morning and grind it out. So I'm here to tell you that's okay if you're getting results. Do more of what is getting results for you. And of course, we'll talk about having some daily minimum standards. But what I wanted to make this podcast about, Tim, was more of like actually understanding what your schedule is supposed to afford for you versus like living in fear of it and constantly having anxiety about it. Does that well, make sense? I yeah, didn't say that very no, well. No, but... it totally does. Well, it's because the, the, the essence of the whole uh, morning schedule, daily routine and all that stuff, mm-hmm. it's almost like it's a... Um, what would you call it? It's a subgroup underneath the whole motivation mindset category. Yes, I would agree and so with when that. you go to the bookstore, in essence, you'll see all these books about, you know, your find your big why and all mm-hmm. these other mindset y sort of pseudoscience, touchy feely type topics. And always a shelf or two away is you're gonna find all the schedule managing sorts of things. And I'll put them all into the same bucket of pseudoscience, mm-hmm. really in essence. Sure. Because the fact is is that um, there is no ideal schedule because everyone's different. In yes, essence. that's true. And there is no, uh, and you're different. And by the way, your um, your most effective time a day might be different than mine. Probably is. Mm-hmm. And furthermore, the older you get, <laughs> you know, how are you eating and how all kind environmental things also affects when you're going to be more effective. So you might right now be somebody like I'll, I go in big cycles personally, where sure. I'll be. Um, you know, I'll be more effective in the afternoons than the mornings. And right now mm-hmm. I'm just going through the exact opposite cycle, but that's called mm-hmm. being normal, right? Well, yes. And I think as you get older and you get more business maturity, you start to be more aware of that. Like I can remember me too, right? Even especially like in our twenties and thirties where you have weeks where it's just like, maybe you just kind of felt off and it would be like three or four days before you actually realized it. Hold on. You said thirties past tense. I thought you were 35. I mean like my early thirties. Oh, okay. So, so we're sticking <laughs> with the, catch. we're yeah. sticking with your 35 exactly. thing. Exactly. Okay. okay. So like when I was a teenager, <laughs> anyway, um, but you know, I think as you, as you get older and Hold more on. observant. I just figured something else out. What? You're now kind of a millennial. So I, you, I'll go with that. So you went from being Gen X to a millennial. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Huh. <laughs> I'm trying things out. Okay. Got it. <laughs> but but wouldn't you agree that as as you get going and you, you know, like you do more business, you get a little experience in life, you can be a little bit more or you should be more introspective to see what your personal tendencies actually are for productivity. Oh, definitely. And I'll, but I'll definitely this is also true and this is really the essence and you've mm-hmm. got really five brilliant points that you wrote down. But the essence of it is is all of us have the same amount of time in the day. And and but of the how you use that time, obviously, is, you know, you're going to have to decide where to put your priorities. But I want you to really be honest with yourself. You're probably really only, regardless of your age, effective for maybe three hours a day. And, um, you know, most people probably it's more like 20 minutes a day. And by effective, I mean, it's where you have the ability to really have high level thoughts and get things done, um, you know, at a truly high level, not to use that word, you know, that phrase twice, but that is that is what really goes on. And as you get older, it is that sometimes that window, if you're not monitoring it and if you're not keeping your brain elastic, if you're not, you know, keeping in good physical condition, the window of efficient efficiency actually shrinks. 
And I, you know, I see that happening with coaching clients. They'll oftentimes, um, you know, when they get older, it really is difficult for them to find the time of the day where they can really feel like being drilled down and and motivating themselves to uh, be drilled down, which goes back to one of our founding principles was if you want ever increasing long-term levels of success, do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level, which means you have to force yourself to move past those feelings. And so we're not contradicting ourselves. What we're doing is reinforcing that thought with some good old-fashioned um, science. And that's the, those are the many of the points that Julie's about to share with you, philosophical and science uh, points, I would say. Yes, and you know, I was thinking, I read an article about people's behavior in quarantine and the pandemic and working from home. And you know, people had filled out surveys, and then this was a big discussion. I can't remember. I think it was a psychology today or something like that. And the prevailing findings were just what you said, that the actual productivity that somebody has, like doing their actual work product, whatever it may be, um, ranged somewhere from a half an hour to two hours a day. There you go. And that, that the people surveyed discovered that thanks to the pandemic, because what they were doing, working from home, was compressing all of their work into a very efficient chunk of time. <laughs> Why? So they could go outside and play, so they could spend time with their family, so they could spend eight hours on Netflix, whatever it was. But they had, you know, kind of inadvertently compressed the actual work into that time slot. Yeah, in other words, which I thought but, was interesting. Well, so the same thing happens when people will inadvertently take their two hours worth of work and make it somehow spread over a 10 hour work day. Yes. Same concept. Especially like if you're going to a building and having to, you know, appear to work. Right, exactly. Work theater. So, yeah. And I, you talked on Clubhouse this morning about the um, catching a plane phenomenon. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you're hyper efficient. You get all of it done. Why? Because you have an actual deadline. So I think all these thoughts are related, but. Um, And we mentioned Jordan Peterson earlier. If you guys can catch any of his talks about various topics, I think you'll find that of interest. Uh, We certainly do. So point number one, (laughs) one of the things he said was, your schedule is not a prison, okay? Set up your day so it's what you actually want. Set up your day. So This is a great thought. This is kind of a great filter. Set up your day so that it ends better than it began. What would it take for you to make that happen? For you to, you know, maybe have some moments of gratitude, even keep a gratitude journal at the end of every day. Uh, Zoe's been keeping hers (laughs) pretty active lately. It is kind of funny when she's bad. (laughs) We make her do pages in her gratitude journal. And she doesn't quite get the concept that, you know, well, of course of all, we're using a gratitude journal as punishment. But, well, that, but we're reminding her to be grateful and did not be bratty. That's right. And it's so thought. so funny when she's being forced to do her gratitude journal, the things that she shows she's gratitude, in gratitude for. Like, I am in gratitude. I am, I am what was like a it, pencil. It, <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to ask the question. You have to write a sentence and draw a picture. What are you most grateful for today? Or there's a prompt and then you have to draw a picture. And I think her, when she does stuff like that, she's like doing little kids sarcasm. I know. That's when what she's, she's really doing. she's really pissed, she does yeah. like, well, I'm grateful for my eraser, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or my lamp. Not not like for mom and dad and having no. a roof over my head and having two French bulldogs. No. No. <laughs> so it's funny to look through her journal pages yeah. over 30 or 40 pages and see You can almost remember what she was being punished for on that day, depending on her answers. If she's truly sorry, she's more she's more like uh, authentically grateful and more emotional about it. If she's just doing her time, then she has those goofy answers. I know, which is hilarious. We probably all are like that. But the thought is set up your day every day. What's it going to take for you to end the day better than it began and stop looking at your schedule as a prison of things that you have to do? Think, you know, this is kind of how you're thinking about it, positively versus negatively. Point number two, this is an interesting thought. What is your ratio of responsibility versus reward? In other words, what are you going to do and what are you going to get? That's the point of drilling down and having two or three, maybe four things that are mission critical during the day. What will you do and what will you get? There's a great example on Clubhouse this morning of Ziggy who made three calls and set three appointments. So what are you going to do? All right, I'm going to make myself pick up the phone. What are you going to get? Listing opportunity. And you know what? I, as she was talking about that, my my thought was um, all, most of the stress wandering around in the wild in real estate right now comes from the buyer sides. For sure. You know, and, and what a great relief and what a great superpower she, for example, um, has been developing that she can pick up the phone, pick up three listings. I mean, that's pretty awesome. So what do you get and what do you, you know, 
what do you do? Negotiate with yourself versus tyrannizing yourself. The whole time management thing really is a game of self-management and negotiating with yourself, right? So maybe there's something I don't really want to do, but on the other side of it, I got to remind myself what I'm going to get. Anything you want to add to that? No, I was just thinking back to all those books, the bookstore, basically, they're all kind of saying the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. But really what they, they, there's no real practical nature of any of the books, really. They're just giving you the strokes, but, you know, and they then try to motivate you through stories. But, Mm -hmm. and those are good ways to learn. I'm not necessarily criticizing that, but I was just thinking through, it really does come down to so often to people feeling resentful towards their schedule. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately what they do, just like Zoe in her gratitude journal, you're going to kind of half-ass it. Right, because you have like this underlying resentment of it. And I think it's when somebody else tries to impose a schedule on you. Yes, but but your perception is having to follow a schedule at all is being made to do something. Right, and that's the same reason when Zoe's actually showing gratitude in her gratitude journal, Mm -hmm. you can tell the difference versus Mm -hmm. when we make her do it, and you can tell the difference. And so that's the difference between a lot of, I think, a reason that some people struggle with uh, this whole scheduling aspect is they'll read a book and they'll say, well, I'm going to do this schedule, and it's not, you know, it's not an alignment with really maybe even their physiology. Sure. Or their, their natural tendencies or habits, right? Right. Um, I, I think a lot of those are like, you know, you suck if you don't get up at 4 a.m. Oh, know? I know. That, isn't that hilarious? <laughs> like, no, I, I personally, I, I, I have some kind of physiological issue with starting the day when it's still dark out. I, I just, it's hard for me to process Well, you're going to, I see one of your points that you're, ha, that's coming up, but that is really worth uh, talking about. And it is this, hey, look, it's part of this hustle ca- uh, culture, sure. as the millennials call it. And mm-hmm. I'm all for it. I mean, yeah. you and I would have been, uh, if, you know, we are in that age group. Oh, I'm sorry, you are in that age group. Thank but you. if we are in that age group, uh, we definitely would be considering ourselves part of the hustle culture. Yeah. But, and, and, and really, you do get a hell of a lot more done when you get up in the crack of dawn, for sure, even before dawn's crack. But the uh, cost of that is if you're not getting sufficient amount of sleep, you might be in operation, but you're not operational because mm-hmm. your brain is still asleep. And I don't know if you guys have ever experienced, I'm sure most of you have, um, like when I remember when Julie and I, we came back from being in Europe for a while <sighs> and we yeah. were, um, and the, um, uh, what's it called, Julie? I'm forgetting. Jet lag. Jet lag. Yeah, the jet lag. We, we, we didn't feel it. You don't feel it for the first day. Maybe you don't feel it for the second day. But I remember Julie and I were going on a long walk. Mm-hmm. And I remember like it hit me so bad, so fast, I almost passed out. Because yeah. my brain was just saying, nope, you're going to sleep. <laughs> that's yeah, it. That's you're it. You're off, you're off your cycle. You're and off your schedule. It, you it need just, a break. It was extraordinary how, you know, physiology will, you know, you, you can have the strongest willpower ever. I mean, here where Julie and I, we're not going to have jet lag and we're going to go on a hike and it's going to work. Funny. We're going to walk five, you know, 10 miles. Or our mindset will prevail. Our mindset will be. And then all of a sudden our bodies go, nah. Wow. Yeah. You know, and, that was it. And this was a long time ago too. This was 2011. Was. That's right. Yeah. And I think we're coming back from Italy. Yeah, we were. Yes. All right. So point number three, what would happen if you didn't avoid the things you should be doing for the next year? What would happen? And I would shrink that down because a year is hard to think about. Don't you secretly hate Jordan Peterson right now? I'm yeah, just being honest. Reading these points. I mean, why the hell didn't we say that? He's just so, and, yeah, and, yeah, I know. Clear. So succinct. And the first one, too. I love that first point. And mm-hmm. I like when I read it make every day in better than it began. I was thinking, damn, I hate this guy. We should have thought of that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but at least we're doing something about it. Yep. All right. So. I, and I appreciate what would what would happen if what would happen if you didn't avoid the things you should be doing daily for the next year? Who would you be? And I would shrink that down just so that we can have something practical and actionable. Let's just try it for a week. What would happen at the end of this, uh, you know, the next week if you didn't avoid everything that you knew you're supposed to be doing? Well, okay. but that really again, we're real estate coaches, and we're going to help you guys build a profit successful real estate business. And I love that question because it really does go back to the essence of one of the founding principles of our, you know, our coaching business. If you guys write down the things you're avoiding the most in your real estate business, 99% of the time, the things you write down are the very things that are going to put you in action and help you make money the fastest. So you're, you know, avoiding direct contact with humans, basically, is what you're doing. <laughs> How does that make any and, sense? And in, in doing so, you, you know, hide yourself and, you know, work theater with social networking and making videos and working on your brand and all these other things you guys are um, seemingly never endingly addicted to. But the reality of it is, is you know what you're supposed to do. You just don't want to do it. And mm-hmm. so you'll hide behind the things uh, that you can kind of, you know, placate yourself will get you into the end zone without actually having to do what you don't want to do and you don't want to do it at the highest level, even though you know it's a lie. So that is a great question. Yeah. What would happen if you didn't avoid the things you should be doing for the next year? 
you know, who would you be? And that's a great way to just put a really great explanation mark at There's, the end of that one. These are great clubhouse yeah, questions, and, by the and way. I, that's another reason I wrote those down. Um, I can tell coaching wise in the language that we use, like I am personally training myself as a coach away from saying the phrase, have you gotten through your lead follow up? Mm hmm. I mean, because look at how that language sounds, right? Like, oh, you got to get through your lead follow-up, got to get that over with. Instead, and we shouldn't even call it lead follow-up, I'm training myself to say appointment setting time. That's a great idea. Because that's really the point of it, right? And doesn't that put a different shine on what you're supposed to be doing? The, the goal is not to just get through something. And I think we use that in other circumstances too. Like I, I'm trying to not say that about our workout. I got to get through the workout. Got to go put in uh, that I'm, time. I'm just, I'm, I'm just throwing this down, Julie. You, <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to change. How, I, it's always for me going to be getting know, through our workout. Too. I'm just not going to change it. So you, you can try <laughs> you can to trying, you can try right? to coach me and work on my I mindset know. about working on all well, you want. Well, but language matters. You know, I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> it's so, always going to be you know, I know. something I don't want to do when I don't want to do it. Me too. Level. Me too. Yeah, it's like but, taking my vitamins. But really, if you know. again, go back to that, guys, mentally and emotionally. Write down the things that you are avoiding the most in your real estate business. And it's going to be picking up the phone. It's going to be calling, you know, an unrepresented owner, aka for sale by owner. It's going to be calling a yet to be sold house, aka a si uh, an expired. It's going to be doing all the real direct, you know, sales <gasps> work of oh, real no. estate. That's what you're avoiding doing. But what would you do? What, how different would your life be if you just did, uh, you know, five contacts for sale by owners every single day, work day, you know, 25 a week? You know, think about this, guys. 100 a month, 1,200 a year. How many more houses uh, would you sell per year? I can pretty much guarantee you if you do exactly what I just said, you'd sell over 100 houses. Yes, and you'd probably make the major breakthrough to being a real listing agent too. You know how I know you would? Because uh, Julie and I did it when we were in our early 20s and doing it exactly the way we just said. We were going directly after the people who have their hands in their air saying, hell yes, I want to sell my house. Whereas everyone else was doing, even back in the 90s, even before the internet or social networking and all that, there were most people were you know doing the centers of influence and past client thing, the buy referral thing. Most people were spending all their time on all this passive stuff because they didn't have the skill set and the mindset to do the real work of real estate and go directly after the people that already had their hands in the air. Already had their hands in the air is actually understating it. In the case of for sale by owners, they had signs in their yard that say, with their phone numbers. With their phone numbers that said, for the love of God, please help me sell this house. Seriously. That's what a for sale by owner sign. It's it's a help wanted sign. That's what. Well, I thought it was so funny what Ziggy said her first call. First for sale by owner call of the day. He literally said, this is your lucky day. I was just thinking about calling a realtor today. It's yeah. Like, Okay, so you know half the half the battle is won by just showing up. That's but <laughs> so, that is true. Yeah, but just showing uh, up know. and having energy and enthusiasm, yeah. you're going to win. And how different is that than how people think for sale by owner calls will go? Of course, well, of because course. they it requires it. it because it requires skill. Yes, because it requires skill to get past your you know fear of rejection, mm -hmm. but it also requires skill to know what to say and how to say it. Sure. And I'll tell you guys, uh, you know, a very poorly kept secret expireds for sale by owners, every seller, they always say the exact same thing in the exact same order. Mm -hmm. Like you'll, you will be so, <laughs> so this, this is, this is cocky, but I'll just tell you the truth. I remember when Julie and I were doing that again, back in the nineties when we were doing a lot of prospecting, a lot of over the phone work, I would almost laugh when I would have a, well, in some cases I would, that's the cocky part. When I would have an expired or a for sale by owner, not ask the questions in the, or, you know, basically not go through their end of the script the way that the thousand others that I talked to the same day yeah. had said, because they say the exact same thing in the exact same order. They give you the exact same rejection uh, or the exact same objections in the exact same time. It's almost like there's a coaching business out there that's coaching expired sellers or yeah. for sale by owners or notice defaults or- It is you know, that predictable. It is that predictable. And all you've got to do is just realize that these, they're going to say maybe four different things to you and they're going to say them at maybe two different places. It's so hilarious that when you have somebody that, you know, is either like super, okay, yeah, you're right. You know, uh, yeah, you come out and list it. I mean, it was those kind of type of experiences <laughs> like what Ziggy had yeah. that you almost laugh because it's like, hold on. No, no, no. You were supposed to say no, this. wait, I'm supposed to have more objections. <laughs> Get back to the script, Mr. <laughs> Seller. You're making this too easy on me. Yeah, But that exactly. is how it is. Exactly. So, but you'll only, know, you'll only know that when you make that effort. All right. So point number four, I thought this was an interesting point. It's not, it's literally not healthy to not have a routine. Don't mess with your circadian routine. 
And your example of our jet lag is a good example of that, right? So uh, one of the things that we do talk about in the Harris Rules book and other places about, you know, managing your schedule is that you shouldn't have different wake-up times every day. That's screwing with your circadian schedule, right? So maybe on Mondays, you sleep in until noon because, you know, you had a long weekend. But then on Tuesday, boy, I'm going to be focused on Tuesday. I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. and go on a run. You're actually messing around with your metabolism when you do that. Well, you that's right. And I don't know, like a lot of people, myself included, when I haven't had enough sleep, I actually find myself being more hungry during the day. Yes, it's interesting, isn't yeah, it? And, well, it's I all have, related. Well, and I'm not going to try to understand the physiology, right? No, I think it's interesting. It's something that I want to do some re- – probably turn into a chapter in a book at some point. But, but yeah. does that mean that a lot of the reasons that you're hungry is because you're not getting enough sleep? Yes, mm-hmm. is the answer. Uh, because it's not just me. This is a you know physiological fact amongst humans. Lack of sleep makes you eat more, which then makes you – Gain lethargic. Weight. Right. So it makes you more lethargic. It's just kind of fascinating. Which makes you want to sleep more. Exactly. And, and then it's like, you know, you're not managing anything. So uh, one of the things that he said is schedule stabilizes your nervous system, literally. Yep. I think that's an intriguing thought, you know, actually looking at it from not a, oh, I have to do this work. It's like um, you're actually managing your body. So number five, your confidence comes from doing what you say you're going to do and doing it repetitively. Yep. Okay. This was a discussion on Clubhouse this morning as well, that your confidence comes from actually having that integrity of following through on the thing that you committed to. And I think that that's not just a real estate thing. That's in life, a good, um, you know, rule to follow. So I think in conclusion, you know, end the tyranny of the schedule, really look at what your schedule is supposed to do for you and respect it and craft it so that the end of the day will be better than the beginning. Well, that's really the bottom line, but also realize that you really do uh, have maybe, if you're lucky, if you're operating at a high level, two or three hours of efficient time per day, be careful where you're spending that time. You know, be careful you're not using your best time uh, every single day for low yield activities. And that could be screwing around on Facebook. That could be doing a lot of these other things that aren't going to give you a direct result. Yes. And it, uh, I think it was Kevin Yoder, I believe, said something I wanted to research further. He was talking about the example of getting out of transaction coordination. Uh And he had read some study, I need to ask him about this, about the average transaction takes between 90 and like 120 hours of your time. So let's say that you multiply that by even four pending deals at the same time. Some of these guys have 10, 15 deals pending right now. So how many hours do you actually get back by just having a transaction coordinator? I mean, that's that's a powerful thought because I think that, especially now, like even the easiest deal has I, to take that. That much must time. have included the time. Like, if you think about that, ninety to one hundred and twenty hours. To close oh, I a can deal. totally see that. You think? Absolutely. One hundred and twenty hours to close one deal. Yes. Well, I mean, you got to remember what the the complexity of some of what's going on right now between going back and forth with contingency removals, fighting with an appraiser, that's true, dealing with home inspections, chasing down the other side of the transaction. You're, sometimes clients will ghost you and you've got to go, you know, dial for dollars to get them back. I mean, I think maybe the easier, like, let's say new construction isn't going to take that much time because it's really not up to you to make anything happen. But on your, your quote, normal deals, I mean, I, I can see that. I'd have to count it up. But I, I think that he makes a valid point is that you're doing something that you can pay somebody 400 bucks to do for you. When you're making, say, a $15,000 commission on that, that seems like a fair trade-off for your time. Definitely. And, you know, for there, example. That, well, there's a lot of things like that, too. Sure. But if you think about all these points, too, and you think about, you know, the tyranny of your schedule. Mm-hmm. So if you're acknowledging the fact that you only have really two or three hours of really efficient time and, you know, you kind of conceptual, you, you're old enough that you kind of realize that the whole scheduling thing is a little bit like it's in the same uh, genre, I think, of, this, the, of the books that are telling you you're supposed to have life balance, you know, mm-hmm. kind of written by the same people, same idea, it's sort of mythical, nice ideas. But the reality of it is it's more complex than that. But you also know that it's important that you have a schedule because it stabilizes your nervous system and you can get more done. Well, then what are the things you're supposed to be putting in those hopefully two or three hours of efficient time every day? And that's where you guys – and that really is the big question that you should all be asking yourselves. 
And the answer is, and I'm going to give it to you, it's very simple. And we're talking about work and making money, so do not make this murky with personal stuff, is you want to be putting in there the things that are going to make you the most money the fastest by helping people. And that's going to always be working with listings. And specifically, it's going to be proactive lead generation. It's going to be pre-qualifying, presenting, and negotiating. Those four tasks are the things that are going to be what you should uh, put in those uh, you know, two or three hours, if you're lucky, of, uh, of time. That's what you should absolutely positively hold yourself accountable to doing every single day. The rest of the stuff that you guys think is important is so unimportant in many cases that if you never did it, it wouldn't matter. I mean, haven't you had some emails or some things on your to-do list that you thought were the most important things ever? And then maybe for some, like I, unfortunately, I do this in uh, text sometimes. I'll get texts and I'll think, I'm going you know, to save that for me. I'm going to remember. And then like, Maybe it's something I thought was super important at the time, and I might even write it on my to-do list on my one of my yellow legal pads or whatever, and then I just forget about it, or you know, I it just doesn't for whatever reason doesn't happen, and then like a week passes, and then I look back at it and I discover it, and it's like, oh, well, that wasn't even anything I should have written down in the first place. Yeah, it's a passing you know, thought versus it, a major task. Exactly, I have I do that all the time, truthfully, sure. or I'll I'll just say, well, you know, this is this this looks like it's a huge important thing. And we're going to work on this. And then like the next morning or, you know, two days later, it's like, no. Yeah. (laughs) Or it resolves itself another way. But if I let those things, my point Mm -hmm. being, if I let those things distract me from the things I'm supposed to be doing every day, that's going to get the most yield. It's easy to do. Excuse me. Most yield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I would be essentially having a lot of wasted days. Sure. Well, I think there's, uh, for everybody, there is an opportunity for a lot of creative avoidance. Definitely. By maybe let's just say puffing up a to-do list to take up the whole page because you know you feel like you ought to versus maybe the three things at the top of your page should be set appointments go on appointments and negotiate well right for example and and, and like with ziggy you know we're we're reflecting back on these clubhouses because we do them first thing in the morning Mm -hmm. you know but uh with ziggy she said i'm you know she made three contacts and she said three appointments that's efficient but it was it, the <laughs> funny thing was there was a really nice guy named Matthew Sharp on our yes. uh, and he was we know Matt. he's a great guy yes and uh, he's in Atlanta you know really mm-hmm. huge potential and he's one of these guys that's not doing proactive lead generation mm-hmm. which is great and because um, it gives a good juxtaposition on our our little club rooms mm-hmm. um, and then here you know he probably spends all this money on his brand and his logo and all his uh, time on creating these videos and all this other stuff. You know, it's like an art project. And he said, I like doing it because it's fun. I mean, he was so honest to say that. It's fun. There's no rejection. It's just exciting. It's fun. I feel, you know, like I'm, you know, some sort of creative release. And then you have Ziggy, you know, and his idea is that all these things will result in transactions. And then you had Ziggy who said, well, I spent an hour. Um, I made three contacts. I set three appointments for listings that'll result in, that'll result in probably at least twenty or thirty a grand. And it's like okay, so Matthew has all these things that he's constantly doing, hoping and praying that it's going to result in a transaction. Ziggy picks up the phone and she, in essence, creates money. I mean, that is the difference. Well, and so we were talking about really two things here. One is time, and the other is money, right? Because Ziggy's net on those deals is going to be better probably than Matthew's. Well, both in terms of time. And money and effort spent. Right? You're always buying leads, okay? No, with just, your time or with your money. With your time or with your yeah. money, right? No lead is free. You're always going right. to have to get it. Yeah, but you have to say, well, where am I going to have to spend the least, uh, you know, money, right? Where What's going to cost me the least? It's always going to be direct contact. It always is. That's right. And also, the, the other thing is kind of fascinating, too, that came out from today's was the idea that when, you know, the whole concept of building your castle or building your mansion on someone else's land, that's what mm-hmm. you're doing when you're doing anything other than developing a skill set that you can then apply at will. Like if you know how to pick up the phone and you know how to basically set appointments and you know how to pre-qualify, it does not matter what, you know, Google does to their search algorithm or yeah. YouTube does to this or the other thing. And go ahead. Well, so I was reminded of, um, I think, I think it was Jonna who said who was using the example of Facebook because her husband has this uh, restaurant, restaurant, right? To your point about building your castle on somebody else's land, and you know, nice little restaurant. Normal, I'm sure, it was a normal Facebook page talking about the restaurant, maybe the menu. And what happened? Facebook pulled it down for and, no reason. And it's not like they send you an email saying, mm-hmm. "Here's the three things you can fix to allow us to put it back up." No. You have to spend time trying to figure it out and trying to, you know, work around the algorithm. And why could that possibly have been? 
And it was like for some goofy reason that they had a hard time even figuring out. She actually out. didn't even know. Yeah, still yeah. doesn't know. Yeah, right. And but the, again, how destructive to something like a, a, a restaurant it, or your business, realtors. So you have to really be being honest with yourself about what your intention is with how you're using those two or three hours a day. Otherwise, you're going to be popping around on you know Facebook and you're going to be looking for things to spend your time on so you can perform an, a nice uh, work a routine of you know a couple rounds of work theater, you know. Yeah. And, and you're not really moving the needle for yourself. And then you're going to lose weeks and months and years. And you're going to ask yourself, why the hell am I still struggling? Why do I still not have financial security? Why is it that I have such big ups and downs in my income? Why is it that I've never been able to save money and pay my taxes on time? Why, 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 why? It's because how you spend that two or three hours a day is you're, it's essentially you're just not spending on the things that matter, not the things that matter the most. So I, I constantly... And, uh, you know, courageously challenge all of you guys to really drill down and be honest with yourself why you're not doing the real work of real estate. And the answer always is the same thing. You lack the skill, um, which you can, you know, obtain, but you then have to put, you have to basically just convince yourself to do it. And a lot of the work that, most of the work that's really going to get you the best result in real estate and in any in- industry, by the way, is not going to be sexy or glamorous. I mean, everybody wants to talk about, you know, again, all the social networking and all the online media and making your building your brand and it's sexy, it's exciting, it's new, and there's so many other people that are going to be, you know, ex- experiencing the you know perceived excitement of doing all these things. Where the real work, the people making the real money, they're not even paying attention to the noise you guys are making. They're not even trying to vie for the attention that you're so desperate to have. They're on the phone. They're in front of the seller that you would have otherwise listed had you not driven past that Fisbo ten times on your way back and forth to Starbucks or your kids drop off for school. You guys mm-hmm. get it? They're the ones that are making all the money. They're the ones that are going to then have enough enough profit that they're going to be rich. They're the ones that are going to be silently building networks of multi, multi millions of dollars while you're busily trying to figure out the latest way to make a TikTok video that gets an extra 10 views. Do you guys get the insanity right. of all of it? Well, and I want to make a little point about this too, that you were talking about many of them don't do that because they don't have the skill set yet, which I appreciate. But there's two ways to get the skill set, and you've got to do them kind of simultaneously. One is, yes, do things like study and learn your scripts, all the things that we teach them in Premier Coaching, for example. Yes, that's true. You've got to work on it. But a lot of that becomes uh, more important and settles into your brain and your actual skill set when you actually need it, like real-world scenarios. Well, well, you but- know, Experience comes from putting yourself in situations that you, you're never going to have 100% fluency in this business. It's not going to happen. And when you start to feel like you do, you're developing an ego that will then take you down a few notches because, you know, you're going to lose a listing that you thought you had in the bag, right? So the goal should not be to be perfect at anything. It's an imperfect business, and that's okay. It's okay to make mistakes, and it's definitely okay to earn while you learn. Well, learn that's, while you earn. That's why I wanted to really caution them too. Yeah. They're getting ready to get started, more things to learn, need more information types, or I need a bunch of role play yeah. partners and accountability You'd partners. You've stuck for years in that. Exactly. All you're doing is procrastinating. Yeah. If you want a role play partner, I'm going to tell you who the role, best role play partners are, like ever, the actual sellers that you're prospecting. Yes. That you're trying to proactively lead generate. I mean, even the word prospecting, I have to walk gingerly around because some of you guys are, <laughs> you're, it just raises your Don't anxiety say level. Oh my gosh. Oh my God, Tim and Julie. Oh, that's old school. Yeah. Well, that's something else was said today. Uh, yes. Oh, you guys are doing I'm glad that you said something about that. You guys are teaching old school methods and I thought to myself, no, we're just teaching the methods. methods. <laughs> we're teaching the methods. And and here's the thing also that's funny too about that is that all this stuff that you guys are spending most of your time on is a trend and it's oversaturated, which means everybody and their brother is doing it. And there's a massive surge of agents that are getting licenses now. And most of them are going to be competing for you for the same attention on all the social channels that you're trying right now to invest yourself in. And all it's going to take is all those videos you made, all those things that you did, all it's going to take is the algorithm to slightly change, then you're no longer going to have any kind of you know results at all. You can just be instantly shut down because you built your mansion on somebody else's land. And you know... That's just something you've got to be really, really careful as you're making decisions and how you're going to grow your real estate business because you make the wrong decision on how to spend those two or three hours per day. You are going to lose a whole, frankly, you guys are going to lose maybe what would have been the greatest opportunity of your lifetime. Your real estate license can be the greatest, you know, 
elevation, you know, helium balloon you could possibly imagine, or it can be an, a massive, huge anchor that will pull you down forever. It depends on, frankly, the decisions you make on how you're going to allocate those two or three hours, what you're going to do in that time. So the real thing that's going on now is that the uh, real conversations, and look at Clubhouse as an example, people are moving back towards voice. People are moving back towards having a skill set. And it's obvious to me. Is it obvious to you? So when you say what Julie and I are teaching you to do is, you know, old school, I guess. I mean, I don't have a problem with that. But the reality of it is, is that what you're doing is just a flibberty gibbet trend. And that trend is going to ebb as it's been flowing. And now it's going to ebb. And the people that have the skill set are going to continue to dominate. And the people that don't are going to then have to run after the next shiny silver object. And the, I'll tell you something else. There was a gal named Seven. Mm-hmm. That was uh, evidently Miss Colorado. Did you hear that? Oh, no. Yeah, that's she's awesome. Miss Colorado. Yeah, she says when she goes back to Colorado Springs, she gets recognized all the time. <laughs> that's cool. Well, anyway, so she's 23. Uh-huh. And she definitely totally understood. And I've noticed this with the other, not millennials necessarily, the youngest age of the millennials definitely, but the Generation Z, Z's. they know what I'm saying and what mm-hmm. you're saying, what we've been saying is the truth. And they just, what they're doing is they're learning what we teach. They're learning to go after the business directly because they realize that's where the least amount of competition is. The competition is in doing uh, the the real competition for attention is those of you who are seeking attention. There's virtually no competition in those that are actually picking up the phone and doing the real work because so few people know how to do it. And so few people are willing to know how to do it too. And so the younger generation, this is the reason I'm I'm fearful for some of you guys. You are underestimating these waves of people that are going to be getting into real estate in the next 12 months. And I promise you, I can see what's happening with our coaching business. It's completely taking off because all these people are coming in. A Mm -hmm. lot of them are younger. They've been listening to our podcast forever. They've read our books. They're coming in. They're saying, you know what? I want to learn it the right way. I want to follow one course until successful, you know, focus. Um, and you, know what, you know what they say? They say, just tell me what to do. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Right. Easy, right? And then they go do it. Yep. There's no, you know, ramp up to have to outsmart and outwit yourself and read 47 more books to get ready and, and to the, get started. And the other big group, the other mm-hmm. surge of new agents are definitely new Americans, first yes. or second generation Americans. Mm-hmm. Like look at our clubhouse or look at, for example, the, um, you know, our EXP revenue yeah. group. The names are not... Tim and Julie no, Harris. There's a lot of immigrants. There's a awesome. lot of immigrants. And, and, and by the way, as we have always found for years in coaching, I mean, and I hope nobody's offended by this, but generally speaking, newer to this country tend to work harder and faster and be maybe more grateful for the opportunities and not be weird about that. Yeah. They, they don't have like this whole, I got to get ready to get started and ruminate about it. They're like, just tell me what to do. Exactly. Which and is awesome. Th- th- so we just told you, we gave example. you a very clear view into the future. Now it's going to be up to you whether or not you're actually going to take it seriously and start, uh, you know, learning the r- to do the real work of real estate so you can start getting real results so that one day you can be rich where your money works for you and you no longer work for your money. So that's a good place to end it. Indeed. And I actually have to get to a coaching call and you have to get ready for premier coaching. Yep. So any homework assignment for these guys, Julie? Get to work. Don't over-engineer your schedule. Just do what matters most. That's it. Have a fantastic day. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.